Good morning. Uh, my name is Tom Webb. I'm with St. Mary's University, uh, the Master of Management Cooperatives and Credit Unions program. Uh, one of the things we try to do in our program is to ensure that our students have a lot of uh, thoughtful information to think about and reflect on. And that's what I'm going to try to do this morning. Uh, uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how we think about the economy. And you'll notice the title is a question mark. Is the economy an angry god? Uh, that we must continually make sacrifices to keep happy. Uh, so we'll deal with that a bit later. But first of all, uh, I want to uh, uh, talk a little bit about the cooperative difference. Uh, and uh, there are four pillars that make cooperatives different. One is, the, and this is the most fundamental one, is the purpose of the business. This is what really changes everything. The purpose of the business is not to maximize the return to some shareholders off somewhere else. The purpose of the business is to provide members and communities with what they need in services and goods. That's the purpose of a cooperative. So uh, the, the, around that, you have the other three pillars. Uh, one is justice. And I say justice. Uh, people might use the word fairness. Uh, Co-ops get started because people feel that what's happening in their world isn't fair and it isn't just. And, and so they start a co-op to correct it. That's, that's where our co-ops come from. Uh, and, and our job is to keep them that way, is to keep them focused on fairness and justice. The, the other differentiating parts are that co-ops, unlike other social enterprise, come with a set of values and principles. And whether we, even if a board or manager doesn't buy into those values and principles, there is an expectation both by the people who work in the co-op, by the people the co-op serves, uh, by the community, that the cooperative will indeed live up to those, those things. So that's the roots. And what does it mean when you compare it to an investor-owned company? So in an investor-owned company, the values are up to the board. Uh, whereas they come with the territory in the co-op. Uh, the legal purpose, as I said, is different. Once created, the legal responsibility of the board and management of an investor-owned company is to maximize return. That's what they're legally responsible to do. Co-op manager is responsible for meeting member and community need. Uh, the ethical stance is also different. Uh, co-ops have an ethical stance that rests on justice. Uh, the ethical stance of investor-owned companies is based on charity. If they feel they have some surplus they can give away, then, uh, then that's a nice thing for them to do. And uh, often they do that. Uh, and the final uh, point of, of significant departure is that there really is only one bottom line in an investor-owned company. There are some sub-bottom lines, but those are only in place or in action if the bottom line is already met. So, or if, if the social bottom line or the environmental bottom line uh, helps improve the, the bottom line uh, or the return on investment. Co-ops have a much more difficult task. Co-op boards and managers have to balance multiple bottom lines. And that's an enormous challenge. And I just want to touch on this for a minute. You know, does that mean that everybody in co-ops are good and everybody in business is bad? But we know that's not true. Each of us knows ourselves uh, well enough, I hope, to know that you couldn't go much more than a week back without thinking of something you wished you'd done differently, you'd wished you'd done better. People in co-ops don't get a halo by sitting in a co-op or working in a co-op. Uh, it just doesn't come with the territory. We're just people with all of our failings and strengths. The same is true of people in business. My father was a businessman, and he was a darn fine human being. Uh, and uh, so uh, they're just people in business, that's all. It's just that the structure they operate in is a very different structure. It pushes them to do different things. So the structure is the, is the big difference. And I, when you look at, at cooperatives, you often find what I call drift or, or identity uh, problems or even an identity crisis. Because as they sit out in society, they start off with a very clear idea of who they are. And there are a whole series of forces that nudge them ever so gently toward uh, leaving their identity behind uh, and becoming a, having a faltering identity or perhaps even losing it. 
Uh, and, you know, these are things like the absence of education. You don't educate your managers, you don't educate your board, you don't educate your members, uh, then don't expect them to know. Uh, from the education programs in our society, co-ops are not talked about. They're not in the schools, uh, they're not in the universities, they're not in the business schools, with the exception of St. Mary's. Uh, competitive pressures. Uh, the standard accounting system that we use is one that is a series of measures to help managers uh, account for how they use their resources to achieve their goals. And the goal that's assumed in those accounting standards is maximizing the return on invested capital. So there's a whole series of things uh, that push co cooperatives or nudge them ever so gently, seduce them even, into abandoning their cooperative values. And the challenge then for cooperative managers is to create a cooperative difference. And, and to do that, you have to put the, the values, the principles, the purpose, and the idea of justice at the heart of everything you do. You have to keep going back to it. And You know, we tell the students in our program, put the co-op values, principles, and business purpose up on the walls of all your meeting rooms uh, so that you're faced with them every day. And you have to look at them every day. In fact, not a bad idea if you're having a meeting about something to start the meeting by looking at the co-op values and principles for two or three, five minutes, and then at the end of the meeting when you've decided something, to go back and check and see if the decision fits or if it's an uncomfortable fit. So that's, uh, that's all I'm going to say about the cooperative difference. And then uh, what I'd like to do is talk about the economy because the global economy, the U.S. economy, the Canadian economy, the Greek economy, we're in a lot of trouble. Uh, they're very unstable. And the, these are a set of instabilities that come from a series of crises that are out there. Uh, there's uh, the food crisis, the crisis of income distribution, the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer, the urban-rural crisis, people are being sucked into cities and the rural areas are being abandoned, and the cities are becoming more and more uh, urban slums. Uh, there's a technology crisis in that people are beginning to feel everything is just moving too fast. Uh, the rate of change, there's a, a series of crises with regard to our environment, uh, there's an energy crisis, but the, the real point I want to make about those is that don't think of any of them as being separate. They're not separate. They're all interrelated. The food crisis is intimately linked to the energy crisis. The price of oil goes up and we have an agricultural uh, system in the world that's heavily dependent on oil for fertilizer, for moving goods around, for pesticides then we ought not to be surprised if food is immediately impacted, and in fact it, it always is. Uh, the financial meltdown affects the energy crisis, the energy crisis affects the financial meltdown, income distribution uh, is affected by all of these things. So it, it's more complicated, it's a bit harder, but you really need to think about the economy fundamentally as a set of interrelated factors, interrelated issues that all impact on one another. Uh, and I just want to talk about one of them. The, the slide you have in front of you comes from a very radical left-wing magazine called National Geographic. And uh, uh, it's, it shows uh, 650 million years of life on the planet. And what it shows is, is, is a couple of things. One is that the longer life has been on the planet, the natural tendency is for it to become more varied and more complicated and more complex. So we get all kinds of different butterflies and animals and birds and plants. Uh, and, and the numbers, the varieties keep multiplying. Uh, but then if you look at the graph, you'll, you'll see that there are some very sharp downturns. And these are mass extinctions of life on the planet. And almost every one of them is linked to a massive volcanic eruption or an asteroid striking the planet or some catastrophe. But you, if you go to the upper right-hand corner, you will see that we have now arrived at the sixth uh, crisis in terms of die off, uh, a die off of species. And, and what's the catastrophe this time? Well, the catastrophe is our economy. That's our catastrophe. The catastrophe is us. Look in the mirror in the morning and you will see the catastrophe. It's how we have organized our economy uh, is simply mining the environment. So. Uh, we need to do something about those various crises. Now, I love my little stick people, and uh, uh, I like this one. If only Mum had invested our family allowance in mutual funds, 
At 40% return a year, I could have retired by the age of 16. Uh, and it was a very seductive idea, isn't it? I mean, we'd, we'd never have to work, would we? Um, uh, we'd find something else to do that didn't have to produce an income. Uh, greed is very seductive. Uh, I get uh, pulled in by it myself. Uh, the next slide is, um, I, I like it because, as the faintly male person says, I want to build our relationship on self-interest and greed, okay? And the faintly p female person says, no, let's build our economy on them. And, uh, and of course, I, I, the reason I like this slide is you know that if you built your relationship with your significant other on self-interest and greed, the relationship would have two characteristics. It would be short and brutal, both of those. It, and the same is true of your relationship with your neighbors, with the people you work with. Uh, it, it's true with anybody, your friends. It's not what you build relationships on. Uh, and, and, uh, but yet, uh, if you think about the economy, what is it? Uh, so the economy is simply a set of complex relationships that we use to provide ourselves with the goods and services we need. That's all it is. And, and it's not the stock market. Uh, it's not any of those things. Now, uh, some of you may sort of say, well, gee, I felt pretty good earlier this morning, coming in here full of hope, and here's all this. It sounds pretty doomy and gloomy. Uh, but it isn't really. What's doom and gloom is if we can't face that set of problems that, that is causing our ex economic instability. We, we simply, if we can't face those problems, and God help our children and our grandchildren. So that's our challenge. Uh, there is a lot of hope if we can muster the courage to face those problems. There's not much hope if we can't muster that courage. So the economy is not the stock market, and it's not the gross national product. Uh, those are the tips of the mountaintops. Uh, it is not a collection of industries, you know, mining, fishing, energy education, healthcare, the spiritual industry, the water industry, maybe we could dream up an air industry. But you can see as you go down that list, it starts to get pretty absurd, doesn't it? Uh, the economy we often think about as an angry god, and often our politicians talk about it, and economists talk about it as an angry god. You know, we, we, can't, uh, we can't afford to look after children, uh, so uh, they're just going to have to put up with it. We can't afford to educate our young people, so they're going to have to start their lives with huge debts that'll take 20 years to pay off. We can't afford, and there's a long list, but you know, we live in the wealthiest time in human history. Our economy has never produced as much abundance as it is producing today, and yet it seems we can afford less and less. Uh, nor is the economy, can we afford to have an economy that is amoral and value-free. So, the common sense, the economy is a complex set of relationships that people use to provide themselves with the goods and services they need to live meaningful lives in their communities. That's what it is. That's my working definition of the economy. It's a human construction. It's not something that's out there over which we have no control. We decide how the economy works. We shape it. We can do the economy however we want to do it. Uh, so will this economy work? Hmm. Well, uh, could a cooperative economy work? Can we build a, an economy that is more stable and more reasonable and more people-centered? There are 350,000 co-ops in Europe that have an output equal to Canada's gross national product, the 10th the, the, uh, largest in the world, ninth largest in the world. Uh, cooperatives and credit unions have more than a billion members around the world. Uh, 236 million people in India belong to cooperatives. Uh, nearly 3 billion people around the planet uh, have a significant contribution to their well-being made by cooperatives. And cooperatives provide over 100 million jobs around the planet. That's 20% more than all the multinationals in the world put together. You know what? I think it works. I think we can make this work. Uh, I think we can build a cooperative economy that actually serves us, a stable economy. Um, the debacle of 2008, uh, let's just turn to that for a moment. How did co-ops survive in that 
Well, there are a number of things to remember. One is the co-op shares and value were stable. Secondly, the co-ops, uh, the largest 300 co-ops, grew by about 14 percent between 2007 and the end of 2008. Uh, that's not what was happening in the rest of the economy. Cooperatives and credit unions did not contribute to the mortgage-backed securities that sunk the global economy. So what cooperatives have to offer is a stable, better alternative. And now I want to end with a challenge to consumer co-ops. Uh, you know, we, the, the uh, namesakes of mine, Beatrice and Sidney Webb, coined the phrase, the consumer is king. And unfortunately, uh, I don't think they had it right then, and I don't think they have it right now, especially. Today, the consumer is a peasant. And why do I say that? Because the consumer has to uh, figure out an enormous amount of information in order to make reasonable choices. So if you buy a car and you say, well, look, I want to buy this car so that it minimally contributes to environmental destruction. Uh, I, I, I don't want any child labor involved. I don't want any sweatshops that, uh, that employ and abuse women involved. I don't want, and you have a list of things that you don't want to contribute to when you buy a car. You say, well, where, where can I find a car that will match that? Well, good luck to you. As you got to find out where the steering, meal, uh, the steering wheel was made, where the brake pedal was made, uh, where the, the, the trunk uh, uh, cover was made, where the hubcaps were made. By the time you sort that all out, the car is 10 years old. All that stuff is sourced somewhere different. So people now live in a world in which it is almost impossible, and we see this every day. Many more people would like to make environmentally positive purchases, but they don't. When you look at what goes through the cash register, they're not making them. And when you probe behind it, you find out that they're confused and they just don't know where to turn. There's the opportunity for cooperatives. Look at the values. Can we provide consumers, can we provide people, can we provide our members in society with information they can trust? So they just know the co-op may not be 100% accurate all the time, but they're, this is the best it gets. That's what we ought to be. We ought to be the best they can get. How can we do that? Well, Wikipedia built the most accurate and largest encyclopedia in the world with 225,000 contributors. Our co-ops have a lot of members. We have a billion members around the world. Can we harness that power of a billion members to begin to provide people with information they can trust? Because we know those people can't get it on their own. The only hope they have is to gather that information with people they can trust, in a way they trust. That's the opportunity. So the opportunity is, can your co-op use social media to engage your members, to draw out what they know, to have them contribute to the co-op? Can you mine their expertise? Can you use them to create your strategic plan? Can you provide information to people they can trust? So those are some things to think about. And uh, I want to thank you for your patience in listening. And uh, I, I wish you well in your discussions. I wish I could be there to share them with you. Thanks.